We know exactly where each thing is going in each bed. They're labeled. We know what varieties go in there. We know our spacing. And so we will pull the rest, compost it, feed it to our animals, amend the soil, and then it's usually just that whole week we try to get out. Well, we are back with Jill. Hello. Hello, hello. You recently got one of our Gothic high tunnels, mm -hmm. but you've also had two other high tunnels. So I thought in this one we would talk about what it's like to have a homestead with a high tunnel and what advantages that has and some of the things you had to do along the way to put some of these up. Yeah, I couldn't imagine not growing in a tunnel. Um, it just allows us the ability to grow year round. And that really is the perk, right? Especially for a homesteader, I feel like when you want that sustainability, you want to be less reliant, you literally, you know, with a high tunnel, you are then able to grow food year round for your family, which just makes you less dependent on outside sources. And so we're able to get a head start. We've got a tunnel just for vegetable production, which is where we do our family's year round production. We have a tunnel that we just use for seed starting. And then the tunnel that we got from you guys is going to be our specialty flower production. So all of our high-end flowers that we want to have protection against, we want to be able to grow earlier in the season and have them last longer and really just pest damage, which I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute. But right. they have been a game, you know, game changer for our homestead and even just for the profitability of our family as well. So let's let's just go down some some key items that we commonly get. Uh, we're going into the winter of 2023 as we're recording this, and we were talking about yesterday. People want to know how to heat these things in the yeah. winter. We don't. We do no supplemental heat, and in fact, our current tunnel, um, it's not really secured the best way, right? I mean, there's a lot of air getting in in a lot of different ways. It is a lot warmer in there, but we still will have to put up you know, nine gauge wire with row cover when it's getting super cold just to create those little microclimates in there and make sure that it's staying insulated well enough. But I think the way to combat against having to do any supplemental heat, I don't really think it's necessary. Grow those varieties that can be grown within that season. And I speak about this a lot because I find people trying to grow citrus in a high tunnel and then it never bloomed, right? Well, <laughs> one, where are you at? I, I could never successfully grow an orange tree you know, in Arkansas, in my high tunnel without trying to create that subtropical environment. And it's not worth it at that point. The amount of heat I'd have to put out to do that, I could just buy it, you know, from somewhere else. And so I think that's a lot to consider. But if you walked out in my high tunnel yesterday, aside from the tomatoes that are hanging along, I have brassicas, I've got root veg, I have things that can withstand frost that are meant to be grown in this window so I always tell people, grow within the appropriate seasons and you will find success and you won't have to do all of these supplemental things. Now, granted, in my seed starting tunnel, we are bringing in a heater or a propane, um, but that's because those are delicate. They're not super established. And the way we kind of cut down costs there is we'll put up plastic and cut our greenhouse in half and just heat half of it as we're slowly filling it up. And so, yeah, do not think you have to have... That, the seed starting one in particular plays into uh, seed, uh, knowing what seed temperature it takes for to germinate. Tomatoes, peppers, they need to be a higher germination rate. Lettuces do not need to be on a heat mat. They're just not, it's too hot for it. To right. And even for us, I have a beautiful seed starting tunnel and it still doesn't make sense for me when I'm just slowly starting out, right? I got those peppers, those tomatoes, those eggplants. I have a rack in my house with grow lights. As soon as you walk in, it's in my entryway. It's more cost effective for me to start those things in here than run a heater for a couple of trays. Right. You know, and you're you're already heating the house. The ambient temperature is real close to what it needs to be anyway. Absolutely. And then I'm able to keep a closer eye on it. And then of course, you know, especially if you think about doing soil blocks, depending on how you're starting your seeds, you know, I mean you can crank out a lot of soil blocks in a very small square feet area that you might not ever even need, you know, a hoop house for seed starting. For us, for starting seeds all the time, it's just helpful. It's nice to have that designated work area. Yes, for sure. But yeah, I mean, aside from January, well, really kind of February. February is when we're starting to move stuff out into our seed starting tunnel. That's when we're bringing in a heater. We're only turning it on at night. Um, but as far as our hoop house, we have no intentions of heating that, um, nor do I think we will ever have to. That's a good way to look at this. You're, so if you're, we're, we're looking at, you already have stuff growing right now. You do plan to do seasonal adjustments. 
move over to more brassicas, you know, we're going to take down some of the vine crops and move throughout the season like that. If you're starting seeds in February, what is the main tunnel production looking like at that point? As far as like what I have growing in right. February? Yes. So we did multiple successions of our brassicas and our root veg and things like that to where we would still be harvesting. I think our last harvest is the end of January. And so what we will do at that point is we'll start turning a bed. So we'll start top dressing all of our beds and adding amendments. And we'll probably have a good month a lull where we're just feeding the soil from what was previously harvested in it. And then we'll just wait to get ready to plant out that next round. So we do have, I would say probably about a four to six week period where we have got our last harvest out and we're just really emphasizing on top dressing beds, amending everything, then to plant out again. And again, yeah, we mentioned this uh, on the previous recording that you're feeding, you're still feeding your soil year round. Year round, you have to. Yeah, for us, we are feeding our soil before a crop ever goes in. We're feeding the soil after we pull that crop out. And then we're actually feeding the plant itself with prebiotics um, the entire time, once a week, while they are just growing. I'd like to discuss the frost blanket mm -hmm. deployment. Like, I know you guys have it ready, I know you guys have systems in place. At what point? does the weather turn and, and that's the factor for putting those out? Yeah, so we actually, in the fall season, I don't know if you noticed when we went out there, we'll have a big row of frost cover. We have it on a T-post and we already have it in the tunnel ready to go. We already have our nine gauge wire because what we do is when we plant out our brassicas, because it's still kind of warm here when we do that, our first succession, we will put insect netting. So we already have the, you know, nine gauge wire that we're using our hoops in place and we will just trade out that insect netting once our brassicas get established and we don't really have to worry about the pest damage anymore and for us because we are in arkansas and we have a very mild i mean it's been 60s and 70s you know and next week is christmas so we just have very very mild winters we won't actually get a real winter until february march usually and so we are constantly watching that forecast if it's getting below 30, that is when I'm going to go ahead. We've already, you know, we'll just go and cut that uh, row cover. We've got big clamps that we keep in the greenhouse. Everything's already there. So we know, but really it's just Nathan and I looking at the weather. Okay, it's supposed to get low enough. This might actually not do well. We need to cover it. Um, for our tomatoes, for instance, we would say, okay, we need to go ahead and harvest because there's no way to cover that. Um, we also know we're pushing the limits on when it can, when they can be grown. Um, but all of our other stuff, yeah, just watching the weather, knowing when's that. And right it's time. not like if you put it on there and it wound up not frosting, it's not going to hurt the plants or anything. No, not at all. Not at all. And same with we're about to plant out ranunculus and crates. We're going to line the aisles of our high tunnels. And I know if it gets below 27, I need to employ, you know, frost cover on those. And that's just knowing what it is you're growing, right? Like you have to have a plan. You have to know what you're growing, know what it likes. I can say, all right, my cabbages can withstand a hard frost, but that celery that I interplanted, it might not handle that very well. So maybe I should just harvest it and stick it in, you know, storage and juice a bunch of it, or maybe freeze dry it to go in different gumbos and soups. Like that's when you just evaluate what can really withstand this hard frost and what's probably just going to be worth harvesting now. I like the notion of that the greenhouse kind of becomes your de facto store. So you don't yeah. have to drive. It's like, we'll go out there. This is, this is what, this is what's available today. This is what we can do with it or save it. That's what makes the homesteading aspect of it so unique is just not having to truly rely on what a farmer would have to do at scale to oh, produce, yeah. produce, produce. Like it can be a pretty place to be in. It could be you know, a sanctuary to be in, but it's also feeding in a slightly non-traditional manner from traditional farming. Yeah, no, and it's so much fun. You know, I think a lot of farmers and homesteaders kind of, the winter's hard, right? There's no, I mean, it's gloomy here today. There's no sun. Like, just the whole shift is different. And as much as as that shift starts to happen and you're so tired from the summer season, you're like welcoming it, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But then at some point, it's getting dark at five o'clock every day. You just get sad. Or for me personally, I'm just like, man, I really miss the beauty and I will. I'll just take a chair. I mean, you saw we had a chair out in my high tunnel. I'll just sit and I'll just listen to the birds. I'll listen to the sheep. And it's like there's still life growing in there, which reminds me, hey, this season's going to come back around again for the rest of the farm. And it's just, it's great for just my mental space. Again, we can build our meals. It's like, what are we going to have for dinner? Well, what do we have growing? You know, and we'll just go outside. And again, we're saving so much money 
because I, I feel like more people should attempt to grow year-round. Even if you don't have a hoop house, there's so much you can grow outside that just can tolerate a frost. But if you save all this money during the summertime, but then you spend all the money you saved during the fall and winter having to source out these things, you know, it's like, well, was that, is it worth it? You know, can I do something? Maybe I can just grow those potatoes or those, uh, you know, winter squashes or things that store really well. And so I try to always encourage people attempt to grow something in the fall and winter. It's less demanding. You have less pest pressure. It isn't a hundred degrees. You don't have as many weeds. It is just for me more enjoyable to grow in the winter. And aside, some of these varieties are made for the winter. They do better in the winter. They do so much better. Like you saw those, I mean, that daikon radish was at least like a one to two pound radish. The thing was massive. Right. I can't grow a radish like that. They will not get that big without bolting in the springtime, right? So the daikon radish, it goes a lot longer than your 30 day. I mean, it's a massive storage radish. So I love growing those in the winter because they just thrive. They get so big. They store for a long time. like Versatile just, in the kitchen. So versatile. They taste amazing, raw, fermented, cooked in a stir fry, baked. I mean, there's so many different ways we can take that one thing and use it in so many different dishes we're cooking in the kitchen. Going past the winter, you know, you're taking off frost blankets, putting them back on. It's now, you know, we're imagining early spring. You have a bunch of trays seeded out, ready to be planted. What's that transition look, look like from removing the old and replacing with new? Yeah, so usually we have, we give ourselves about a week window, right, to flip beds, harvest, make sure we've amended and get the new thing out. Because we have everything on a crop plan and we have a planting calendar, we know exactly where each thing is going in each bed. They're labeled. We know what varieties go in there. We know our spacing. And so we will pull the rest, compost it, feed it to our animals, amend the soil, and then it's usually just that whole week we try to get out that next round into the designated bed. Is that a good time to like look at maintenance issues for a high tunnel, like irrigation, patching oh. some holes, making sure the door's sealing? Yes, absolutely. Irrigation's the biggest thing. It's one of the things I think we replace the most because the pressure on our well is really funky. So I feel like we have holes often where we're having to replace it. So I would say before each new season, you need to go through, turn on that drip, fix anything before you're having to plant it because it's going to be a lot easier to fix that irrigation, especially if you have to lay a whole new line. Yeah. yeah, so we're planting where those are and using that kind of as a guide too. So we'll turn on irrigation, see where the water's dripping. We kind of use that as our spacing. And again, we always keep a crate of irrigation supplies um, on a rack and then we keep a roll of irrigation in there just so we're not having to walk to the front of the farm and go to a different shed and get this stuff. If we notice a leak, Immediately get the scissors, cut it, fix it, right. move on. One of the tunnels, is, it's got some holes in it. It's got some, needs some repair kind of yeah. thing, but it's not been detrimental to the growing. No. And, I'll, you know, it is time that plastic's probably four or five years old. That is something to be mindful of. When you think about the maintenance of having a tunnel, you will have to replace that the plastic at some time. We also live in Arkansas, so we have hail storms. So that was part of the problem. Last year we had a massive hail storm. There's a lot of trees where you're at, too, because uh, I can see, like, some branches falling and, and right. striking it. Right. So there are holes. Um, it's not level, so there's gaps, right, where air's getting in. Um, it's not sealed as great as it could be, but because I'm growing those varieties that can still withstand it being cold, it doesn't affect anything. And even if the sun's out, I mean, we're having to go in there and still roll up the size. I mean, I went in there the other day, and it was almost 90 degrees. Because it was high 60s and sunny. I mean, then that's like, that's where your stuff's starting to bolt, right? Because it's too hot right. for it. So you still have to be mindful of opening up the sides, knowing when that sweet spot is around 2 o'clock. I want to shut the sides to trap the, you know, heat in for the rest of the night. So you just have to figure out that schedule that works for you and be diligent about it. Like, I know. But if sun's out this time, can't wait until 10 o'clock to roll up the sides. It'll be too hot in there. Well, I think it's important to point out that the leaves are not just enjoying the warmth. It's the roots and the soil around the roots that's getting warmed up. So as the temperatures drop at night, it starts releasing that heat, that stored heat that's in the ground. And that's why frost blankets work so well is because it's trapping that the heat that's being released. Yeah, no, it acts literally just as like an insulating blanket, which is really important. And it's important to know, okay, at what point do we need to start trapping that heat where there's enough to be released throughout the night when it is going to get as cold? Um, so again, just I think, 
understanding the crops you're growing, understanding your needs. That's why I like to encourage people, don't feel like you have to grow at all because if you've never, you're not really experienced in this, or even if you are, that can be really overwhelming. If you're growing 20 different varieties and they all have different needs and requirements, that's a lot of upkeep right. and maintenance on you. And so I've got my tried and trues, right? I mean, I'm always growing tiara cabbage, Chinese cabbage. I've got my same kohlrabi. Like I'm growing a lot of things that have similar needs because it just makes it easier for me. And I'm also putting those things in the same bed, right? The things that I know are going to need a frost cover on, mm -hmm. putting those in the same bed so that I can just cover up that one bed. And the things that it doesn't really matter, you know, like if the tops die back on the carrot, but the carrot's established, it'll stay in the ground. That's fine. I'm not really covering up my radish, my carrots, my beets, because the tops can wilt. And unless I'm using that, the actual root vegetable itself is still fine. One thing I used to like to do for my succession carrots is, is use the ribs as we got four feet, we got eight feet, and, yeah. and we're going to harvest four foot or harvest eight foot or plant out four foot or harvest plant out eight foot. And that's a nice little gauge that's kind of built into the system. Yeah. Moving into the spring, I think it's when the high tonal really shines. G given the fact that, you know, you make a few adjustments in your crop selection, you can get through the winter almost better than you can in the summer. And, and then when the rains start coming and you're beds are not getting flooded out and you're not having to constantly worry about what the water damage is doing and the wind damage is doing. You have that springtime protection where things are really getting violent as far as the springs and the winds and all that kind of stuff. So I, to me, the, the springtime is really when that thing is paying for itself. I mean, it's huge, especially if you're in a southern climate where you have like hail and wind damage. This is a lot of what we deal with here. I remember Last year, maybe it might have been the year before, I had taken a gamble. I'd planted out straw flowers, all these things. I had, you know, been diligently managing in the greenhouse out into my raised bed garden. And I'd also equally planted out. I had overwintered flowers in our tunnel that were pretty established. We had a massive hailstorm come. I mean, golf ball size hail. It was intense. Well, everything in my high tunnel, even though, you know, the plastic looked like trash, <laughs> everything was fine. And then everything I'd planted out in my raised bed, I completely had to start over. That put me months behind. And in fact, I didn't get the harvest that I wanted to. And it just set me back because when I should have started it, it was just like threw everything off. And so that's huge, especially when it comes to disease, right? When it's super hot mm -hmm. and humid where we are. Being able to prune and trellis effectively is a big deal, but being able to control that environment is crucial. And a lot of people, they see how beautiful our high tunnels are. Things we're growing outside in our raised bed gardens aren't as beautiful because we, they have a bit more pests. There's, the whole atmosphere is different. We are growing greenhouse varieties that are bred specifically to thrive in that type of environment. And we've really kind of used those hybrid varieties to our advantage with, you know, being able to grow into a tunnel. And yeah, we have, I plant out later than any other farmer in my area. And I harvest fruit before anyone else in my area because I'm growing in a tunnel. Going into the summer, now we're looking at extreme heats, mm -hmm. putting the shade cloth on, we're adjusting the irrigation accordingly, we're raising up the sides. Uh, I know in the new tunnel from us, you're going to have insect netting for the first time and I'm looking forward to you having that because it's a big game changer. I always found that working in the tunnel in the summer, getting out there just as early as possible, doing what you need to do to tend and then letting that thing sit on the tone the rest of the day, that, that's how I enjoyed to do it. No, and it's still about 10 degrees cooler to work in the tunnel, though, than outside, which mm -hmm. is nice. We do always get up early, harvest flowers, try to get those chores done. But sometimes, inevitably, you know, you have to go out in the middle of the day and it's still so much more manageable to be able to go out there with the shade cloth. Um, so yeah, I love that. We do roll up the sides. The shade cloth helps tremendously. We will increase our irrigation to go off twice a day. So it'll go off in the morning and the afternoon um, just to make sure that you know they're getting adequate water. And then with the new tunnel having the insect netting, I was telling you yesterday, we've never been able to successfully grow light colored flowers. Dahlia specifically, grasshoppers are a nuisance. We've got Japanese beetles. And so now that we have the insect netting, those colors that we've never been able to grow before and offer, we'll be able to grow because we just won't have that issue. Just not, you don't have to worry about any sort of grasshopper or pest getting in there. Yeah. And I know I don't have to tell you this, but you know, as, as it comes to insect netting, 
you still have to have IPM ready to go. You still have to have any organic sprays yeah. that, that you guys are certified naturally grown. So that, that still needs to be on hand. You don't want to have to wait because eventually a bug is going to get in there and one bug becomes 10 right. real quick. Yeah. And so that physical barrier slows it down. It reduces the, the numbers that are going to get in there, which means less spray, give you a little bit extra time to diagnose and find these things. So that's, it's not a foolproof thing, but it sure reduces A, the amount of insects that come in and B, the amount of things you have to do to get rid of them. Yeah, and thankfully with the flowers, we can put those mesh bags over them to protect the blooms as well, which is still what we plan to do just to ensure we get the best quality blooms. So there are other techniques you can do as well. But again, I think figuring out when you have your sprays ready to go, you know what I mean, instead of not being prepared and then you get overtaken with the pest and you're like, oh man, I've got to go buy a sprayer and I've got to go order this because where I am, there's no organic options. You know, have those things just ready to go. And I feel like at the beginning of the season, we have all of our stuff. We have these wire racks at the, you know, as soon as you walk in our tunnels and it's just like everything we would possibly need for the season. And I feel like that just helps a lot when we do have, oh man, aphids got in here. We need to treat that right now. Yeah. Also in the summer. And I, I, I'm looking forward to a report from you later on because our tunnel is quite tall yeah. and built, built tall for a reason to give you more air mass that A, is going to retain heat in the winter time and, and, and increase the amount of buffer that you would have from you know temperature spikes and drops and things like that. But given that that tunnel is so high and then you guys elected to put uh, ventilation and, care and cold air induction in there, mm -hmm. it's just gonna give you this nice, constant, fresh air, get all that. It's gonna allow room for that trapped hot air to rise up and get pushed out with fresh air coming in. And that's what we did out of Carl's, and it's a big difference. You want to talk about being under the shade is nice. Being under the shade and having hot air being sucked out is even better. Yeah, I think it's going to, you know, the first year you grow in a tunnel, you got new soil, there's a few obstacles. But I'm hoping with just the style of tunnel that we have and some of the other systems we put in place, we'll still have a year where we can break even on what we put in. So moving past the summer, getting into the fall, now these crops are established and they're really churning out. And then we're seeing evidence of it now, but the temperature does stop to start to drop and the shorter daylight comes into play. Mm -hmm. And man, it's like you get a second spring and yeah. with established plants. And so the volume just jumps. So much. I find this particularly in like our tomatoes. <laughs> we'll notice that like they, it kind of just gives them, maybe they, I know tomatoes love heat, but for us, I find that like, We'll see that real big push again with those late summer tomatoes that we put in and our flowers. I mean, they love just kind of having that break. They're not having to work as hard. Um, and yeah, I think the fall, there's a lot of stuff that's just thriving in those tunnels and it is so beautiful to see. It's the perfect thing for a homestead. It's like mm -hmm. this, this extra bounty right before you need it the most to start storing for the winter. Yeah, and then you've already put up your summer stuff, right? That's one of the things I love is this idea of growing enough food in the summertime to last you all year. Well, one, you're only growing a certain variety of crops because you can't grow brassicas. You can't grow root veg and so, you know, in the middle of the summer or not super successfully. And so it's like, yeah, you might be putting up a ton of tomatoes, but that actually might be all that you're putting up is tomatoes and cucumbers. Like, are you going to get burned out? Because my family would. And so it allows you to preserve your food seasonally. And like for me, I just don't like doing if I had to just spend every single week canning tomatoes, that would get old with me really, really quickly. So knowing that I only have to can tomatoes for a certain period of time, and then I get to move into fermenting something or making kimchi and kraut, and that's really exciting for me. It just allows me to keep moving along with the seasons, and then I can not have so much inside workload because I'm doing it gradually with slower harvesting through spring, summer, fall, and winter. Nobody's land is ever perfect for a hoop house. There's always going to be something you have to do, whether that's run a water line, run electricity, uh, level out. You guys are super hilly. We live and super on a rocky. Yes. So you guys, uh, I think we brought the tunnel over here in early spring. You were dealing with all that. And then it rained. I think it rained every single day for weeks on end there for a little bit, which slowed you guys down. Use people to come over here and help you guys out with that and paid some people to do that. And I, I know there's a lot of extra expense with that. And I think it's fair to talk about, you really don't have another place to put it. This, that is where it had to go. Yeah. And you made the calculations that it was still going to be worth putting this up for the returns that it was going to give. 
but let's walk some people through what they potentially may see just through your eyes if you're on a super hilly or yeah i feel like we had way more challenges putting up tunnels i think we saw this in the tunnel that was already established some of the things weren't done with the previous tunnel and we knew some of the challenges we had because of that so we were very kind of anal in the fact of like okay i know this is going to take longer and it's an extra expense it wasn't done in the tunnel we're currently working in and that makes this hard and this hard and this hard just to be clear the the tunnel that we're talking about that's slightly askew was here before you guys bought it yes yes so our friends put it in um and there just are some challenges because the pad wasn't level so we knew immediately we were going to have to pay someone to come in and level the ground which looked like bringing in loads and loads of shell digging out a huge area but because we are on such a rocky terrain we also had to we have a lot of runoff right water runoff so we knew we were going to have to dig a trench and put up a retaining wall to revert water well we had someone come over with a trencher broke their trencher because the rocks were so big we've had someone else come out they said there's a rock the size of a small car so messed up his machine, he can't do it. And so we've had a lot of obstacles of just waiting and trying to find people with big enough equipment to tackle the job. And that, uh, just frankly, it's been a pain in the butt because it is so hard. And not only think about leveling out the pad, bringing in shell, rock, whatever it is that you're going to do to lay those ground posts, that job took us about two days longer than it should have because we were literally trying to drill into massive rocks. And so you're like, oh, okay, well now we actually have to move it because we're just, there's no getting through that. So that job in and of itself took us quite a bit longer just because of the obstacles we had with the environment we were trying to put this tunnel up in. High tunnels are funny in that the hardest part of putting up a high, a high tunnel is like the beginning. Yes. Once you get started. You're good. It's just, yeah. you learn a new skill and you do it 20, 30, 50 times over and over again. And then you're great at by the yeah. end. You learn a new skill and you repeat that process and none of it's hard. Squaring the post, that takes a minute. Mm -hmm. And most people try to do it when people are shown up to help and yeah. everybody's ready to get going. And then we got to sit and wait for a bunch of math to happen. That's frustrating. Yeah. And I think it's just little things too. It's like we had to rent scaffolding and, you know, that you're always waiting. I feel like because we were inexperienced, we never put up a tunnel before. We were always having to wait on someone else's time and schedule to be able to do these things. And I think that's where we got so frustrated is we'd have a week where it's like, okay, our week is open, we can do this. But then the guy couldn't come to dump fill, right? Because we have to rent a dump truck driver to then go pick it up because we need so much. So there's just so many moving parts in it. Granted, we knew it would be worth it because we knew we would have a level tunnel. We knew by putting up the retaining wall, we wouldn't have any flooding or you know, water runoff and all these other things. So we knew that if we would just bite the bullet and do it on the front end, it would make the flow and everything more efficient down the road. I didn't want to halfway do something and a year down the road have to fix it because the truth is you probably wouldn't fix it at that point. You've already yep. got stuff going in there. Yep. And so we knew this took us way longer than we wanted, way longer than we expected, but we were pretty hell bent on we've got to do it right the first time. Let's talk about running utilities to it. That was the whole Gotta have water. Thing. Gotta have water, don't you? Gotta have water. And then also, we did want to be able to run electricity out there. Um, so we had to have someone come out. They had to put a whole breaker box on a pole. Um, we are having to connect to... We've got frost freeze in each of our tunnels now. Our seed starting tunnel and our established tunnel. And so we have to connect to that, which will then be digging a trench connecting pipe all the way to that, putting in a frost-free hydrant. Um, and again, that might not seem like that big of a deal, but given the terrain that we live in, to dig a trench and run pipe from one tunnel to the other, that is going to take us... It has to be deep enough for the, fro for the pipe not to break in the freeze. has to be deep enough for the pipe not to break in the freeze. That is a way bigger task, but that's one of those things like, okay, this has to be done because if you're going to have a tunnel, you need a frost-free in your tunnel preferably in the back it just it, it's kind of a non-negotiable in fact we didn't have a frost free hydrant in the existing tunnel and we put one in because it was just like there's you got to have one it's just the best way to automate everything for right. you and to be efficient so that's one of the things we're currently working on <laughs> all right now we need to gather supplies for this we need to find someone to be able to come in with a trencher you can't hand dig that where we are 
in the back part of our property, the more rocky and hilly it becomes, which is where we have this pipe, right? It is put up at the back part of our tunnels because that's where we have our frost free. And so those are things that we're just like, all right, this is the next big thing we need to tackle. We've just had to kind of adjust our planting schedule. I wanted to plant stuff in the spring in the new tunnel and realizing, okay, I need to take into account some of these things that still need to be done. And so we decided we'll plant late May and that gives us enough time to put the frost free up, finish getting the retaining wall built just so that we don't plant in vain, essentially. We put these kits together where anybody can put them together. You guys are super busy and you elected to have people help you with yeah. it. And I also think we kind of did that. It's like, Nathan wasn't super confident and comfortable putting up the tunnel. And so having someone come out, he asked a lot of questions. That way, if he had to do any repairs or if we put up another tunnel, I think he would feel confident doing it with one other person. Um, and so I think that sometimes, too, like just know it might be worth it <laughs> to pay someone to come out and teach you. Right. And that's what we did. We had someone come out and be like, all right, I'm a little confused on this. Can you explain this? We, we reread that instruction manual and you guys have those videos. So we'd watch the videos and be like, OK, this makes sense now. And sometimes it might just be worth it. And if we had to throw up another tunnel, you know, it probably wouldn't take us as long. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. Getting out of sequence sometimes trips people up. I, I think you, we were talking before the cameras are rolling that you guys actually put the insect netting on backwards than yep. we should have. Mm -hmm. You know, easy mess. You know, it happens. But it wasn't the end of the world and you got it up. Yeah. We have to build in, we never know who's going to put these things up, right? So we have to build in a set amount of, hey, if it's not completely square, it's going to be okay. If it's not completely right on the nose, it's going to be okay. There's a lot, there's a lot you can mess up to that high tunnel and still have a pretty banger tunnel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can look at it now and be like, ah, oh, we probably should have done this different or that different. But the truth is, it looks great. We're going to be able to grow a lot of beautiful flowers in there. And that's the point of it, right? You're, unless you're a professional and this is what you do. There's going to be something that could have been done differently or more efficient um, as just far as putting it up. But again, I think that's just trial and error, right? You just got to, you got to figure it out. You got to know how to do better next time. Do you guys get nervous during storms and things like that? I really don't. Um, for us, we always make sure we put the sides down because we don't want this to become like a parachute. But because our ground rods, like they're in, right? I mean, we're, we're anchored. That's one of those things we feel super confident of. Um, again, we know our climate, right? I never have a cat tunnel here. Like there's no way we get too many windstorms. We would just probably waste our money. And so we know, all right, we need a certain type of tunnel that is going to be able to withstand our crazy tornado Arkansas weather. But because we are on a ridge, although it does give us a lot of challenges as far as putting things up, usually a lot of things will have hail and wind, but any sort of actual tornado, it usually blows over the ridge. So we're kind of safe in that regard, or have been so far. Well, uh, I can't wait to get stuff growing in there. I, yeah. know, I know it's like it kind of just got finished. Like this was just a right in time down kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, we wrapped it up last week. We've been building out beds. We're still trying to top dress beds, get wood chips in the walkways. So we still have some finishing touches to do it. But And, and we've mentioned this in the previous episodes, but like this year one soil is not going to deliver yeah. as much as it's going to. In, the next few years. Right, which again, as soon as you can start working on that soil, that is one of the things. We have some beds already top dressed. I'm going to be going in, putting azomite, putting feather mill, worm castings, worm tea. Like we're going to just be literally now until we get ready to plant, and even after we plant, continuing to feed that soil. And because we had compost dumped by dump truck loads, it's been sitting outside, which means there is grass seed in there. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to plant out and then you've got all this grass and wheat seed sprouting. And so what I'm going to do is just spend the early spring being very diligent about every single day going in and cultivating all those weeds out. So hopefully I have a little bit of a handle on that before I'm actually planting out my crops. And so I think that's important too. Like if you know your soil has been sitting out and, you know, we got it back in the summer. Um, those are just things that I'm trying to be mindful of so that they don't overtake the plants that I'm growing. That that's the fifth or sixth time you've mentioned systems yeah. in here, which is which we're going to talk on the next episode to kind of help people learn how to plan out and know when to plant and when to pull and when to do the change outs. So looking forward to the tunnel. Yeah. The Thanks New too. Year's. See you in the next episode. Sounds good.